the roots of the Drake Municipal Observatory can be traced back to a Civil War romance, something that nobody ever realized. Then you have the fact that George, in 1863, George T. Carpenter married J. Henrietta Drake. And you're wondering, so what? <laughs> Actually, at the time, uh, both were employed by Oskaloosa College, not to be confused with William Penn College. Um, Oskaloosa College was a Baptist college. And what was interesting about this is the fact that uh, George Carpenter and Henrietta uh, Drake both worked there. So that's where they met. Uh, Carpenter was actually the cha uh, chancellor of Oskaloosa College and a professor of literature. Uh, Ms. Drake was a professor of music. And between the two of them, they got together and formed a bond. Now, who cares? Well, it seems that when Oskaloosa College was in the process of going under, uh, Mr. or Professor, say Professor Carpenter decided that he needed a bigger city than what Oskaloosa could divide. So he and a whole bunch of people decided that they were going to move the college or a college to Des Moines where the population at the time was about 80,000 and could definitely do a better job in supporting a college. The trouble is they needed some type of uh, monetary support. Well, it seems that Henrietta's, well, anyway, so uh, uh, Mr. Carpenter and Miss Drake uh, here you have a possibly the only picture I can find of them, and they are in the front together. But I'm not even sure that this is a, a good picture. Um, but this is actually probably about 30 years after the uh, uh, this whole thing happened at Oskaloosa. But it seems that Henrietta's brother was Francis Marion Drake, a brigadier in the Union Army, uh, a very astute businessman. Uh, he was also, he worked for the railroads. Uh, he also, I mean, he was a banker. This man had money and he decided that he wanted to keep his sister employed. So, he volunteered his time and his money and Drake University was formed. Um, I can't find exactly how much uh, Brigadier Drake uh, gave to uh, Drake University over his lifetime, but the closest I can find is the fact that it was eventually in the millions. Uh, he gave the starting $20,000 to get the uh, uh, articles of incorporation filed. Uh, he also gave $20,000 for the building of Old Main. And he, was, uh, he also served as the chairman of the board of trustees for a number of years. And he was actually governor of Iowa for one term. So this man had definitely had some connections. And because of that, uh, he donated to Drake and the trustees uh, took his name and they uh, plastered it on the university. Now at the time 
that Drake was being thought of, they decided they were going to buy some land uh, in order to put the university on it. So they uh, bought some land, uh, actually uh, what, they, what they thought was university Avenue. Actually, this map is a little bit weird because university at the time that Drake formed wasn't called university. Um, I have some old maps, but I can't get them small enough to put them on a slide. But what's interesting here is the fact that Waveland Park uh, is actually pretty close to where they wanted to have the university. So with the formation of Drake University uh, came the, the buildings and the uh, the, the planning of the first building was Old Main, and that was uh, started in 1883. Actually, it was opened in 1883. They actually started it the first summer that Drake was, was started. Uh, of course, 1883 is two years after Drake opened. Now, what did they do until Old Main was opened? Well, they had another building that they used, and this was called uh, the student house. This was a, as you can see, is a very large building. It had 42 rooms, which included classrooms, dining rooms, uh, dorms for men and women. Uh, and it also had a furnace room that was lacking a very vital piece of equipment for that first winter, a furnace. Uh, they didn't get the furnace until about February, March of that first year. The fact that the building wasn't burned down for heat is rather amazing. If you're trying to figure out where this building was, uh, when this building was finally raised, uh, right around the turn of the century. It was actually knocked down around 1903, 1905. Howard Hall was built in its place. So I'll give an idea of where that building was. It was actually located behind Old Main. So this was actually the first, I shall we say occupied building on campus. The third building that was built on campus was the science building. And as you can see, it has a nicely brick and it had a four story uh, stairway leading up to an observatory. This was built in 1893. And unfortunately, the telescope didn't get there until 1894. And the telescope was a gift from Francis Marion Drake uh, in order to give the, uh, the uh, science building something that it can boast about. And it was a very superior instrument uh, for any time. Uh, there have been a number of instruments uh, built like this and uh, an eight and a quarter inch uh, F-22, in other words, a very long refracting type telescope. So this was, this was the home for the first telescope for Drake University. And again, this was in 1894. Let's go back about 18 years and in uh, February of 1876 in a log cabin. Sound, sounds pretty normal. Uh, I think most people were built, born in log cabins or something like that. Uh, this is where Daniel Morehouse was born. And like all people that we, we think of that were born in a log cabin, uh, he always had to walk 10 miles to school both ways uphill. So, well, whatever. Anyway, um, Daniel Morehouse, uh, Daniel Morehouse's father 
basically a uh, a farmer. He was a merchant. Uh, he did a lot of different things. But one thing he believed strongly in was an education for his son. So Daniel Morehouse went to school. He went to uh, community colleges in uh, Minnesota. He was born near Mankato in Blue Earth County. And uh, just like Laura Engels, uh, he taught in school. In fact, this happened to be a, uh, uh, as a, uh, a knockoff of Laura Engels' wild cabin. So I'm just using it to show the type of cabin that uh, uh, Morehouse was born in. But it was most likely something very similar to this. Morehouse also received a very classical education. In other words, he not only learned, you know, the uh, uh, math and uh, all the, uh, the sciences and the English, but he was also taught not only Latin, but also Greek. So he had a working knowledge of Greek and Latin, and this came uh, as a very important side uh, story to Dr. Morehouse. Anyway, as I said before, uh, Dr. Morehouse's father was a merchant. He was a farmer. Uh, he uh, basically uh, uh, got land and farmed it. Uh, and he was a Civil War veteran. He came in, his, his starting rank was private, and he rose through the ranks with his ending rank again as a private. So obviously not, uh, not a tremendous, uh, you know, a, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 showing in the, uh, in the armed services. He was, injured he did receive wound he was wounded uh during the civil war and as a result uh he got a pension that lasted for the rest of his life his pension was about four dollars a month which that translates to about seventy dollars a month now so if you, you know looking at what mankato Minnesota looked like at the time it was uh, a beginning uh, the beginnings of a sprawling uh, city uh, he went to Northwestern Christian College in Excelsior Minnesota uh, he taught for a couple of years around uh, Mankato and then he's transferred to Drake University in 1897 and the story goes that when he first came to Drake, uh, he, was, he really didn't have a whole lot of direction. But a neighbor uh, to him uh, from that uh, student building uh, came to him because she learned that he knew Greek and he, she gave him a Greek textbook that was on astronomy. And Dr. Morehouse took the book and he rewrote it in English. And he gave the neighbor the English copy, kept the Greek copy for himself and read it a number of times from cover to cover. Something in him sparked he suddenly saw that astronomy was the way to go. Now, when he came to Drake, uh, again, he was taking the basic courses. Uh, he was also on the football team and he got a pretty good uh, ranking as far as his, uh, his uh, uh, athletic abilities were concerned. But you have to remember, 
that he was a farm boy. He was, uh, he was probably in excellent health. He was probably quite strong. Plus he had the mental discipline to do his schoolwork. So it was a really, a, 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 for him, it was a tremendous opportunity to learn and to be a part of this growing community. He is described by one of his friends as dapper, which goes back to the point where he actually worked part time in a new department store that had opened uh, a number of years earlier. It was called Yonkers. And he worked in the men's department where he apparently had a very, shall we say, up to date. A wardrobe of men's clothing. So he, whenever you see pictures of Dr. Morehouse, he is always dressed so well. I mean, uh, so because he, he kept that, that uh, uh, shall we say, that dapper look about him. Uh, so he, in his spare time, usually it was, you know, almost every night, he would climb the six stories up to the top of the science hall, and he'd use the telescope. Telescope has now been there uh, probably for about five years, and he used it, just used it like crazy. But he was very disappointed in it. And the reason, uh, you have to remember that Drake at the time was almost downtown, um, had, fall, had uh, uh, basically uh, uh, pollution. Uh, and then the other part of it was the fact that the, uh, the trolley was actually on the street just outside the window. And every time the trolley passed, the building would shake. And this did not bode well when he was taking pictures through the telescope. Basically, it put an end to whatever observatory, whatever picture taking uh, that was going on that night. So he decided that he wanted to move the observatory uh, basically away from this particular place. But he didn't quite know where to move it two at this point. I did find an interesting picture. That's one of the labs. And from what I understand, that's Dr. Morehouse. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that it's right, but the uh, I'm not even sure you know, if it looks like him, but uh, definitely a fairly young person. Anyway, uh, he graduated from Drake in 1900 with a BS degree. And immediately, he was offered a professorship uh, to teach astronomy and physics. And uh, he went on and got his uh, master's degree from Drake in 1902. And since his future was now assured, he decided it was time to get on with his personal life. Uh, he was married to Myrtle uh, Slayton in 1903. They had three children, Charles Vega. Yes, it's named after the star and Francis. Uh, Francis lived in Des Moines until uh, her passing in, in um, 2002. And I knew her. Uh, she would stop at the observatory and we would talk. And when the Des Moines Astronomical Society uh, built their building up in Ashton, uh, she was, uh, she wanted to see it. She wanted to see this great observatory that the amateurs built. 
And I was on the, my on my way up there on Highway 330, and she had probably the biggest Cadillac ever made. Um, and I, I saw this white car coming up behind me on Highway 330, and she comes around. She knew my car. She comes around and she literally drives me off the road. And I get out and she gets out and she asked me one question. Do you know where you're going? I go, yeah, I'm going up to Ashton, Ashton Observatory. I says, good, I'll follow you. She knew it was off of Highway 330 and she knew that I would be on it. How she got to me, I don't know, but she, she definitely saw the observatory that night. Well, she was definitely quite a character. Anyway, um, Morehouse decided that he was going to go back to school and get his PhD. So he applied to the University of California. He was admitted there and he mentioned that he wanted to do research on the seventh moon of Jupiter. Now at the time, Jupiter, they knew that Jupiter had 12 moons and this, they were in the process of gathering information about this. So he decided he was going to do his, uh, his study on the seventh moon. That seventh moon was named uh, Ilara in 1975. Up until then, it was always called the seventh moon. Anyway, uh, Morehouse uh, decided that he was going to uh, discover all the things about Ilara. Unfortunately, uh, Lick Observatory, where this moon was discovered, was not available to him. Now, Ilara is actually one of literally dozens of moons going around Jupiter. And it's, I mean, it's just another basically dot in the sky. So trying to find it amid the glare of the planet itself is a, it's a bit of a, a bit of a task. So he decided he definitely wanted to get this done. So he applied uh, to the University of Chicago and he got use of the Yerkes Observatory. Now this has, this picture has nothing to do with uh, Dr. Morehouse, although I think you can recognize Einstein in the middle of all this, but it does show the telescope that uh, Morehouse used uh, in order to do his study of Hilara. And it was in this telescope that he made an amazing discovery. He, in 1908, in the midst of gathering data for Hilara, or I should say Jupiter 7, uh, he discovered a comet. And he decided that, well, it's, you know, at the time, since he discovered the comet, it was named after him. And he decided he was going to learn everything he possibly could about this comet. So he left Chicago at that particular point, actually is Williams Bay, uh, Wisconsin, where Yerkes was. He came back to Des Moines and he took pictures through the telescope of everything that comet did. And as a result, uh, he was able to figure out, actually he got all the uh, readings of how this comet moved. And he discovered that it was a basically a solar system visitor. In other words, it was actually a in a hyperbole, it was hyperbolic orbit. In other words, it wasn't a recurring uh, uh, comet. 
It was one that just happened to be passing through. And he took down all of the information he can. And they found that this comet, you know, it was just basically luck that they found it. And, and he took lots and lots of pictures. He discovered how it was put together. He uh, took spectrogram, uh, spectroscope readings of it, found out what it was made out of. So he uh, did a lot of work with his comet. And as a result of this, he became the comet expert. And uh, he would put on, as you can see, it's. May 17th, 1910. Uh, this is while uh, Halley's Comet was actually still in the sky. And he charged 15 cents for people to listen to him talk about the comet. That translates to about $4 today. And I think, gee, I would like to charge $4 a person. Well, anyway. Um, anyway, um, so he became the common expert. And in 1914, he finally got back to University of California and he defended his doctorate and he was awarded his PhD from the University of California for his work on Jupiter 7. He was absolutely enthralled. I mean, he was so excited about astronomy that he used during football games. Now, Drake University was one of the first universities in the country that had night games uh, for their football. And as a result, the the stadium actually had uh, night uh, lights to illuminate the field. What Dr. Morehouse would do at halftime is that he would turn off all the lights and he would have one of his astronomy students with a spotlight from the theater department point out the brighter stars. He would actually do star ID from the middle of the football field, uh, pointing out to you know, pointing out to the people that were in the uh, uh, stands, all the great constellations that were seen in the sky. Uh, and during the fall, you have some really good constellations. I'm not sure if the spotlight was good enough, uh, and of course, there weren't any lasers at that particular point, but he would point out the sky at halftime. Now, besides astronomy, I said, mentioned it before, that he was a tremendous athlete. And one of the places he loved was the brand new Waveland Golf Course. As you can see, it was established in 1901. He was back on campus uh, about uh, 1905, 1907. So he would play golf. And he found that the wide expanses of the greens was tremendously relaxing to him. His uh, you know, all the tension that was built uh, during the course of a week, he can relieve all of it by playing golf. And Waveland Golf Course has, has a rise uh, right around the 18th tee, and he loved it. In fact, there was a windmill there that would be pumping water. And he said, that's the perfect spot to have an observatory. It's away from the smoke and the noise and the vibrations of the city. There's no way that they would ever build around it. So that's the place to have an observatory. And at that point, uh, Dr. Morehouse used all of his persuasive abilities 
to not only persuade Drake, the, the trustees of Drake, but also persuade the city to build an observatory for the benefit of the people of Des Moines. From the start, this was an observatory for the people. It was going to have what he considered to be research grade instruments and a research grade uh, uh, housing uh, for the advancement of astronomy. Now, according to what I can find, the cost to build the observatory was about $55,000. And I'm sure it was more than that, but I can't find any, any other notes on that. And from what I understand, Drake University actually bought most of the, uh, of the bonds to build the observatory. So it was a combined effort by Drake University and the city of Des Moines. And this was some of the uh, blueprints that were used in order to sell this. And Dr. Morehouse made some pretty amazing concessions in order to get this built. And immediately, if you are a true follower of Drake Observatory, you can see that here is a front view of the observatory. And you can see that there are stairs going down on both sides of the main entrance. And on one side, you can see the word women. And this was actually a rest station in the middle of the golf course where people can go in and use the facility. So this, and again, that was something that the golf course needed. And so it was a little bit easier to pass that particular uh, uh, bond issue in order to get this built. The other thing that was built, that was put into it, uh, if you can take a look, here you have, uh, here's the uh, uh, assembly room, that's where the auditorium is. You have the office. On the other side, you have something called a transit room. Now, Dr. Morehouse called that the clock room. And you're saying, what could a clock room be? And I'll get to that in a minute, because that was another concession that Dr. Morehouse made to the city of Des Moines. People would actually come in and go down the stairs to go to the bathroom at the observatory. This is the lower level, and you can see the bathrooms down there. You have a photographic room. Uh, there was a dark room down there, uh, and I had, I remember uh, the chemicals that were in there, and the chemicals had to be, they actually had to call a hazmat in order to go in there and take the chemicals out of there. Uh, and then, as you can see, there is, you know, here is a cross section of the front, and you can see the uh, observe the uh, telescope on the second floor. Just to the left of that, you have another pillar going down. You have a uh, an area, so I can get this right over here. And this pillar going down to the ground. What that is holding is something called a transit instrument. And let's see if we can find some more. There it is. This is known, this is a transit instrument. What it's used for is to calculate position and time. Now, the idea is that as uh, stars move across the time, 
from across the sky, when they are at the high point or the meridian, that is the sidereal or sidereal time that it happens to be. And this is, you know, it's because it's based upon the position of stars. Now there is a conversion between sidereal sidereal time and local solar time. Now we, our watches and everything is all based upon local solar time. So Morehouse had this built as a way of telling time. So what? Uh, at the time that this was built, uh, they actually had a board on the wall right over here and something called a recording chronograph, which is on this side in the back over there. The astronomer looking through this telescope, you can see it's a very small telescope, but looking through this telescope would see when a star would be on the meridian and they would press a telegraph key that would put a mark on the recording chronograph. And they had another one of these things downtown in the train station. And it would put a tick mark on their recording chronograph. As a result, this was actually a local timekeeper which was important for the railroads. And the way it worked was they would see a star and there was a reticle in the middle of that telescope. And when that star, as it was moving across the sky would be in the middle of that reticle, they would press the telegraph key that would put the mark on the chronograph. As you can see from a from an air from an aeroplane, it's how that how this thing worked. H a e r o p l a n e. Uh, you can see that the the observatory is on a rise. Uh, as you can see, the, the I believe the 18th hole is over here. Um, and you can see that there are some, some views of the observatory right here. And you can see that there is a railing around the outside. Now on top of the, uh, the assembly room, there is also what they call the promenade where people could wait and see and actually wait to look through the telescope. And that didn't have a railing. In fact, I remember working up there without the railing, which scared me. And, you know, but they finally put a railing up there, and uh, now uh, now you there are actually two scopes that are usable up there. Morehouse was convinced, or wanted to convince the others, that the the telescope was of research quality. And about uh, well, several months after Pluto was discovered uh, in uh, 1930, in February of 1930, uh, he had the telescope uh, aimed at Pluto and he took a picture of it uh, showing that yes, this telescope could find Pluto as well. So it was definitely a research grade observatory. And that's where the observatory is. It's sitting in the middle of a golf course. And as a result, as a result of the fact that it's sitting in a golf course, we are possibly one of the few observatories on earth that have bulletproof windows. Um, I do know that when I first started there, we had these grates that we actually had grates that were on the windows. And even then, uh, golf balls could actually get through 
and uh, break the windows. Now the telescope wasn't uh, just uh, you know uh, consigned to be just at Drake Observatory in the middle of Des Moines. They actually took it off the mount and took it literally all over the world uh, to do Dr. Morehouse's research. The telescope uh, actually was tied to the top of a car. I, I saw that photograph and I couldn't believe it, but they actually tied the scope to the top of a car. They had boards so that the, the scope would not bend. And they uh, drove it out to Colorado. They drove it out to Vermont, uh, all over the place in order to look at eclipses and other astronomical uh, phenomena. It even went to England in 1927. So this telescope was literally all over the world. Dr. Morehouse was even present at in Corning, New York, at the pouring of the first mirror for the Palomar telescope. So it was just, you know, and he was everywhere. And he was a great promoter of astronomy and of Drake University. It was during this time that Drake actually got a worldwide recognition for its work in astronomy. Dr. Morehouse died on January 21st, 1941. He was 64 years old. People said that he, he was so bubbly, so uh, uh, driven that he just wore himself out. And with his death, uh, he was cremated and his body was put in the wall in the, uh, in the entry rotund as you walk in. As you walk into the building to the left, you will see some plaques and they are uh, for Dr. Morehouse died in 1941, and also for his wife, who died 23 years later. And the simple, uh, the, the simple inscription on the plaque above it tells exactly what Dr. Morehouse's dream was. He wanted to have an observatory where the people it was basically built for the people of Des Moines to learn about astronomy and to basically engage in feeling the beauty of astronomy. As I said before, um, the science building uh, on campus uh, was actually uh, sitting right next to where they built Cole's Library. And that was raised in 1949. They knocked it down. Right now, if you can find it, there is a plaque there. And it's uh, kind of neat. I mean, it's a, you know, it's sitting in the middle of the grass out there. And in 1941, when Dr. Morehouse died, the observ a little bit of the observatory died too. But the observatory is still ongoing. We still have lectures in there. It is still situated in the middle of a golf course. And we have lots of people who enjoy astronomy in that building. It does show the ravages of being on a golf course. Make no mistake about that. 
Uh, sometimes I wonder if people get frustrated because of this hazard there and they simply take their pot shots after at it. And we have volunteers who will come and help out with the running of this telescope. This is David Stapleton. He is a, a, a graduate of Drake in physics. Right now he's heavily into IT and uh, he volunteers at the observatory. We have people, lots of people, about 2,500 per year come through our doors to learn something about astronomy. And we have Drake students who help out with that. We have uh, students in astronomy, uh, students in math. Uh, we had, uh, I know in the past, we had uh, theater students who would help out, who liked astronomy and who would help out with that. And uh, lots of people enjoying astronomy. This, this particular student came from Malaysia. And when asked if they wanted to have more programs in astronomy, uh, this was the answer. They'd like to have more. And someday there might be more. I, at least I, I, hope, I hope we can get through this virus and reopen the observatory for people to come and enjoy uh, looking through telescopes and learning about the sky. We have other things in there besides astronomy. Uh, usually in December, we have something called Guitars Under the Stars, where we have classical guitarists coming in uh, and demonstrating their abilities. Just a tremendous, tremendous concert. And after which, if it's clear, they'll go up to the dome and look through telescopes as well. The floor is an amazing uh, piece of work because nobody knew what it was for the longest time. And I spent uh, <laughs> a very long winter's day in there and discovered exactly what was going on with this. This is actually the configuration of the planets at the time that construction started. Uh, actually, when the first brick was laid, it was, they actually broke ground in August of 1920. And this particular date is October of 1920. So this is actually the cornerstone of Drake Observatory. So, Tonight is the last night for the uh, spring series. I'm sorry, fall series. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold things late. For the fall series, we'll be starting again in April uh, for our spring series. If you'd like, this is the 100th anniversary of the observatory and you can help us celebrate. So go to uh, this particular website, and we can keep the dream alive for the next hundred years.